Well, let's see. Today is the 15th, so you have 16 days uh, that remain. And not much more of today is left, so 15 and a half days uh, to prepare yourself and to prepare your heart and to get ready to minister to other people that are coming for the, uh, for the meeting. This is, uh, this is their watering hole, and you've become that to them. And uh, the thing you want to be aware of is, is to make sure that you're careful uh, not to let anything get between you and the Lord, especially not right now, but you're going to need it in the days to come. Uh, things that are going on in the world today are beyond human comprehension. Although history is somewhat repeating itself, if you haven't been a student of history, you wouldn't recognize it. But many of the things that you're seeing right now are things that occurred uh, over a long period of time many years ago before many of you were even born. And why is that important? Because the Bible says, that thing which shall be hath already been, the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, preacher, how do you maintain during that time? I won't tell you it's easy. Uh, the Christian life is not a life where it's intended to be flowery beds of ease. It requires an effort on your part to remain in fellowship. Everything in the world is set about in the world, the flesh, and the devil to do its best to disrupt the most important thing in your life, and that's your fellowship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't recognize that, then you're going to have difficulty. Your expectations are going to get dashed because you're going to think, well, it should be easier. It's not easy. I wish I could tell you as you get older that it gets easier. It doesn't. It gets more difficult. Amen. And uh, so what you have to learn to do is, is you have to work at it. It's a time to be selfish. So how do I accomplish these things? We talked about what it meant this morning in, in Sunday school. Now we'll talk about the medium or how is it that I am able to accomplish this. Look, if you will, please, back in 1 John. We'll pick it up in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, uh, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all, from all sin. Good. You did well. Brother Mitch, you pray and ask the Lord to help us. Would you please? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for today, Lord God. Another good day in you, Lord God. Glad to be a part of your done for us today, Lord God. Thank, Thank you for the, the rain that you, uh, you've allowed us to see from heaven, Lord God. Yes. It's just a miracle. Amen. We're thankful for it, Lord God. I ask that you continue to open these doors, Lord God. Allow us to walk through, Lord God. Uh, and you just hold our hands, Lord God. Uh, keep us focused on you and the main thing, Lord God. We're thankful. I ask that you continue to bless, Lord God. Bless our preacher and the message that he's prepared, Lord yes. God. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you. Can be seated. Turn, if you will, please, to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, now, now, let me say this to you. The, the measure of a Christian is, is that not the fact that you're struggling. The fact is, is that you're doing everything you can to keep struggling. And uh, that says a lot about your character. It means you love the Lord. If you continue to try to fight through it and understand it and let the Lord do what He's going to do, those things become real important to you. And it's not easy. But the fact that you hadn't thrown in the towel and quit and done like a lot of other ones, it says a lot about you. Pardon me, I had something hung up there and I couldn't get it out. But part of the thing that happens with Christians at the first sign of opposition, difficulty, or problem, uh, a less mature Christian will wind up just throwing in the towel and quitting. What do I have to learn to do? I have to learn that who is it that benefits by me quitting? Now, anybody that's in here that's been saved longer than six months, you've had times in your life where you've considered giving it up. You say, what happens? What that means is, is that you're not walking in the light as He is in the light. You're not able to see that that opposition is there. And the reason is, is because what you're doing and what God has planned for you has some value to it. It's important. Or the attacks wouldn't be coming. Now, what is the value of it? He doesn't tell you that. What's the importance of it? He doesn't tell you that. You know what he says? How shall two walk together except they be agreed? What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to learn that if I'm going to stay in, the, in that sense in fellowship with him, then I have to find out what it means by him to walk in the light. Galatians chapter number 5, if you will. Look down, if you will, to verse number 13. 
The Bible says this, For you, brethren, have not been called unto liberty. You only use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you not be consumed of one another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Would you agree with me that one of the ways that you determine if you're walking with the Lord is, is your toleration of the brethren? Look in Ephesians chapter number 5. I know that's not popular. Uh, Bible believers have a propensity or they have a tendency. Uh, they label people pretty quickly. We're bad about that. Amen. Catholics, charismatics, different people. We, we have a tendency to do those things and make them out to be enemies. Well, you ever realize this? They're in the position they're in for the same reason you're in the position you're in. They were raised that way. What if you were raised Catholic? Where do you think you'd be tonight? Do you think you'd be in a Bible-believing church? What if you were raised with a living Bible in your hand or a New American Standard or an English Standard? Or what if you weren't raised with a Bible at all? Do you think you'd be sitting there with a King James Bible in your lap? You see, oftentimes what happens to us is because God's been so gracious to show us things that we forget that it wasn't by His grace that He showed us those things that we wouldn't even be here tonight and be saved. Amen. And so now it's not just saved, it's now the Lord's provided me and most of you have a pretty good solid Bible education as will be indicated in a couple of weeks by the amount of people from this church that are graduating from school. But not everybody's been so fortunate. Not everybody was raised like you were raised. Not everybody has been in a Bible-believing churches. I know we have problems. I'm not unaware of that. I know we have difficulties. But the issue begins to be is sometimes you have to learn to love individuals that are not like you. Amen. That's a hard thing to do. You say, why? Because we're all more comfortable when everybody's like us. That's why, generally speaking, we all get along pretty well. But we have certain things that are in common. Well, then what he says, when he says love the brethren, that means you have to learn, learn to love saved people that don't have everything like you do as far as doctrine is concerned. Right. That's it. Now, the minute that doctrine begins to affect your walk with Jesus Christ, then they have to go. I'm not saying that that's not true, but sometimes we're in too big a hurry to get rid of somebody. The Lord's going to tell you that when it came to foot washing there in the book of John, the Lord said, I've done this as an example to you that you might do it also to others that they may know you love one another. And that by your expressed love one toward another, that you also show that you uh, love me. Do you know whose feet he washed there? He washed the feet of a God denier, Peter. He washed the feet of a betrayer, a devil, Judas. Well, I don't know if you've ever been there or not. Whether you've ever done it to another individual or not, I've been guilty of the same things the apostles were guilty of. I've deserted them before. It may not be something you would see or recognize, but I know when the Lord spoke to me and told me to do something, give a track or to give a word or a witness or a testimony, and I've chosen not to do so. You've never done that before? Well, you must be a fourth part of the Trinity. Sometimes it's inconvenient. Three o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden I wake out of a dead sleep and he says, you need to pray for so-and-so. And I go, okay, well, I will when I wake up. And then you wake up and go, who was I supposed to pray for? <laughs> you ever done that before? I'm sorry, I know y'all haven't. I'm just giving my testimony. <laughs> but a lot of times it's to pray for the brethren. We need each other. Amen. And the Lord's trying to show you that there needs to be continuity between you. And one of those things is, is the way that you have that, is Jesus Christ was a friend of publicans and sinners. Amen. Can I just mention this to you? When you first met Him, you were lost and on your way to hell, and Amen. Jesus Christ saved you, yes, and you were unlovable. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel says, you were after birth and cast out, and nobody would supple you, nobody would care about you. They didn't put any oil or any water on you. You were still covered with the flies and the maggots because you had come out from your mother's womb, and nobody would even bother to pick you up. And the Lord came along in that filthy, nasty, dirty condition when nobody would touch you, and picked you up, and cleaned you up, and washed you, and suppled you, and put oil on you, and wrapped you up, and cuddled you up, and took care of you. Now, that's not easy to do, but that's what he did for you. And you have to learn to do that. And I know there's limitations on it. I'll grant you that. Uh, but sometimes we draw too hard of a line in the sand sometimes over things that are not important to do. Look in Ephesians chapter number 5. Uh, let me grab the uh, thing here. I lost it. 
Ephesians chapter number 5. Three shakes of a lamb's tail or more. Where's that thing at? There it is. Uh, 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful work, there it is, of darkness, but rather reprove them. So what does that mean? If he's the light, there's no darkness in him at all, then should I be running around with dark things? But the dark things, ladies and gentlemen, that have become commonplace nowadays, I'm talking about dark movies and Ouija boards and talking about satanic influences and demonic things, things of the darkness, things that are, the darkness here is utilized in the sense of satanic influences. It's not just being around bad people. It's being around the things of darkness. It's getting real commonplace. Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't mean to offend, but it's going to offend. You have one of the darkest days that's coming up in the United States or anywhere else for that matter, and it is 13 reversed. It's October the 31st, and it's called Halloween. And that's going to be coming up here in about two weeks. And some of you are going to go out and say, well, I'm going to dress up as a Bible character or I'm going to put tracks out with the candy that I'm going to give out. That's the darkness. That's darkness. There's nothing good about Halloween. You say, well, what about the candy and stuff? Go buy your kid a bag of candy. Don't be ridiculous. It's darkness. The stuff is connected. Now, I could give you some horror stories and some things, some ghoulie monster cases and things that I dealt with a bajillion years ago, and it wouldn't mount to anything to you because you make up your mind when it comes to worldly things, you don't recognize that it can be worldly, but when it steps into that arena, arena of darkness, you got to separate from those things. Why? Because you walk in the light as He is in the light. Let me ask you, do you think Jesus would have a Halloween party or have what they call trunk or treat party in the parking lot to give your kids an alternative on October the 31st instead of knocking on that you go ahead and have the party of the apple bobbin and all that called a fall festival in your parking lot? Do you think Jesus would say, well, that'll work. I mean, you know, after all, you live in the world. We put out a thing out there about Halloween. We do it every year, and they're flying off of that. I've heard a couple of the comments, oh, well, I don't really know. I mean, that's not what I see it as. That's one of the most wicked holidays that there is out there. But even if nothing wicked happened, who is it attributed to? You find it attributed to Jesus? Can you find it attributed to one of the apostles? How about let's attribute it to somebody in the Bible? It's not there. What's it attributed to? It's known as the devil's holiday. And we have people in the neighborhood, they're hanging skeletons and stuff out there and spider webs and, and putting graveyards in their front yard. I mean, tombstones and stuff like that. I mean, you, you ever think about that? These kids have gotten accustomed that you ought to be afraid of that stuff. And if that's what you want to do, that's your business. But you can't do that and say you're having fellowship with the Lord. Now you say, don't judge me. I'm judging you. You said you're going to walk in the light and you're doing Halloween? You put on a mask. Come on. I mean, you know what? Some of you would scare everybody half to death if you took your mask off on Halloween as your mask and they'd realize you've been Halloween the other 364 days a year. But you know what happened? You got into a day where preaching on drinking and preaching on Halloween and preaching on those kinds of things. You know what it winds up doing? People say, well, that church ain't for me, man. They're too straight-laced. They're too stiff. They're, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not cool. I'm not cool. I'm not cool at all. I don't want to be cool. Except when it's 100 degrees outside and air conditioning. I don't want to be the world's way of cool. What I, I'm an old fogey. I'm stuck in the mud. I'm old school. Well, you know, well, you need to learn. To, I'm not loosening up. If anything, I'm tightening up. You say, why? I need that. Well, we don't. You need to relax a little bit. You relax, okay? It's not bothering me at all. I'm not too spun up about it. But I get wore out with Christians that tell me, I just don't know what's wrong with my fellowship with the Lord. And let me ask you a question. You ever listen to some of the music you listen to? Amen. Oh, here he goes. You're going to talk about rock and roll. You know, I mean, you know, everybody loves a little bit of rock and roll, preacher. You know, I mean, after all, old, old Elvis, you know, he's an old rock and roll. I mean, you know, and, you know, I, I, okay. You ever listen to the stuff? You ever listen to what it encourages? You listen to country music much? Back in the old days, you could take that record and play that record and play it backwards and the guy gets his truck back and his dog back and his <laughs> shotgun back and all that kind of stuff. Come on now, that's funny. 
And the guy said, you know, one time he sang a song about all the things he lost in, the, in, the, in his uh, divorce and all that. And he lost his wife and he lost his truck and he lost his gun and he lost his dog. And he said, and I sure do miss my dog. <laughs> That's funny. You know what that stuff does? It cultivates the wrong attitude toward God. It cultivates worldly and carnal pleasures. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things of darkness. I flipped across there last night just because I'm preparing for today. I flipped across the little scroll thing. It's a guide or whatever you call that thing. And I looked through there. I counted 10 things. No movie channel, nothing like that. None of that. Just 10 things on the guide that were Halloween movies. Exorcist, Exorcist remade, Ghoulie Monsters, Murder Mystery, Murder, Murder, Slaughter, Kill. You know, I, good night, man. You say, what is that? Those are things of darkness. Amen. If you don't believe in demon possession, I don't recommend you read it at nighttime, but you read just a little bit of history about some of your serial killers, yeah. yep. it'll make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. You say, why? That stuff's demonic. Amen. I don't know why you'd want to look at it if you didn't have to do it for a living. I don't know why that draws you into that, why you think that that stuff's good. There's something, just, would you just trust me when I tell you, it's better you don't know it, then you don't have to worry about when it pops up. Amen. You have to constantly pray and plead the blood over that stuff. They wind up having a nightmare in the middle of the night and somebody's coming in the house and they're trying to get everything, beat your wife half to death thinking she's the bad guy and stuff like that and trying to wake you up. You say, where does that stuff come from? It ain't PTSD. It's seeing stuff that you had to deal with. Why would you want to do that? Why do you think it's fun to get scared to death? That ain't fun. Let's go to a haunted house. No, thank you. I've been in enough haunted houses. I don't want to be in a haunted house. I've been in places before. You go in in the middle of the night and the lights are all out and there's nobody around. Supposedly a bad guy in there. Pretty haunted to me. Amen. Worrying about whether or not he can see me and you can't see him and all that kind of stuff. That's scary stuff to me. I knew I had to do what I had to do, but that's scary stuff to me. You say, well, I was scared. S-K-E-E-R-E-D. I'm still scared. I set the alarm at night and that thing goes off one night in the middle of the night and you know I'm grabbing what I needed to grab and I'm sitting there going around this stuff and I'm thinking why am I doing this man just call somebody come get whoever this is that just came in my I ain't like one Adam 12 man I'm like Barney Fife you know <laughs> here baby you go check it out you know <laughs> Uh, the stinking window thing wasn't all the way down and it misconnected or whatever and woke up the whole neighborhood. You see, why do you do that stuff? I sleep better knowing there's an alarm on. At least somebody gives me a chance to get ready for it. At least I can see them kill me before they kill me. <laughs> Things of darkness. How about you? You have an affinity for the occult? Ouija boards and soothsayers and horoscopes? That stuff's demonic. Amen. You know what, I can't say I'm walking with the Lord and then I'm out there saying trick or treat in the name of Jesus Christ. Trick or treat, what is that? Amen. You know, I've seen more people be bold enough to go to somebody's house to get a bag of candy and you wouldn't go to somebody's house and knock on their door. Amen. Good preaching. It's a strange thing. You say, well, I don't want my kids to suffer. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Your kids around here especially don't suffer. They get candy and cheese balls and stuff stuffed in their face every time they turn around here. Somebody's running around, the old man's over here, you know, giving out candy and stuff. It's okay, he's an old man, he ain't a weirdo. He's just being nice. But you kids give out candy, then the deacon comes up here and you come up here. You kids don't come to say hey to me. I'm just between you and the deacon. <laughs> and your parents make you stop and say hello to the preacher. It's kind of like, tag the bass. Hi preacher, how are you? <laughs> You know I'm telling the truth. And you older ones did the same thing. Now you grew up. Now you just walk past me like, Bro, Larry, can I have that? I'm going to give it to some of the kids. <laughs> yeah, you ain't fooling me. <laughs> and you say, what is there? There are certain things to take a stand against. Your enemy's the devil. Yes, the Bible said he's a roaring lion, walks about seeking made about. I'm not inviting him in. Amen. So what do you do? That's our date night. That's our date night. You, what do you do? We turn off all the lights and act like little kids. We go back in the back corner of the house and pull down all the shades and it doesn't look like anybody's at the house. 
You say, aren't you worried about them tearing up? I can fix it if they tear it up. I'm not worried about you. What are they going to do? What are they going to think about you? You're the only house in the neighborhood that's dark. They think he don't participate in that. You say, well, I don't want to do what you want to do. I'm afraid of that stuff. The things of darkness, the one you're wrestling against. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities, power, spiritual weakness, rules of darkness, and high places. You better be aware of who your enemy is. I ain't inviting him in. You can do the history of Halloween and all that other stuff. The bottom line for me is it's connected with the devil. I don't want nothing to do with it. Amen. Now you get home, you get in the, kid in the car and go buy him a donut, hot and now on the way home, get him some hot chocolate and that kind of stuff. And then come by and say, now the preacher is entitled his opinion. And he gets a little carried away sometimes. He goes a little too far to the right. That's just how he is now. He's an old man and he don't have kids around. Hey, listen, I don't have kids. I got great grandkids. I know who I'm talking to. Well, Paul, Paul, don't you think, uh-uh, you ain't doing that here. You better stay at the house. Amen. So what'd you do? We hide on, th on Halloween. Yep. Amen. Now, I don't mean for the whole sermon to be on Halloween, but some of you are real good and uncomfortable right now. Preach. You see what's happening? I've already seen the trunk or treat signs out. I've already get the stuff in the, the, uh, the mail and all that stuff saying, come to our church and it's an alternative to Halloween. On the same day? Uh-uh. And you go ahead and dress up, but just dress up as a Bible character. Man, are you kidding? When we do Christmas plays and stuff, we don't even let you dress up like Frozen around here. Amen. Amen. Ain't, that the, ain't that the Frozen? Ain't that the princess thing or something? Yep. Let it snow or let it snow or... What? Oh, let it go. Oh, I thought it was like, let it snow, let it snow. <laughs> okay, let it go. That'd be a good, that'd be a good sermon, let it go. You just let it go. <laughs> Say that, Mike, let it go, man. You're hanging off the end of a clip. Let it go. <laughs> you said let it go. And for the one time you did what I said to do, you said let go, you know. So I let it go. We, we, don't, we don't do that stuff. Dress up as a Disney character. Amen. I mean, come on, man. What do we do? We want the world to know we're different. Amen. Amen. But we don't do it at Halloween. Amen. You say things of darkness. I'll come to this here in just a second. But you know the thing you got to recognize? There should be a distinction between you and us. I mean, between you and them. They should recognize. No, thank you. You have to be a jerk about it. No, thank you. You have to give them the history of Halloween. No, thank you. I don't put a jack-o'-lantern out there. You, I don't care how you carve it. You take a knife and carve out a face. You're practicing to be a serial killer, man. <laughs> That's weird. Isn't that weird? The preacher, it's just kind of cool. That's like making, a, like, that's like making a eggs a color and putting stuff on them. And then put them in a basket like a rabbit gave you an egg. You need biology 101. <laughs> Where did you think an egg came from a rabbit? Who taught you that? And, and even if it did, they don't come out colored? With all kind of stuff on them? Eggs are for eating. Or cooking. Ephesians 5, back to it. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Reprove them. I just did that. Would you agree? Now look at him. It goes a little further. It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in where? You know, he said, leave that stuff alone. Amen. Just stop talking about it. Amen. You disagree? It's a free country. You can do what you want. But all these things are reproved or made manifest by the... Uh-oh. And whatsoever doth manifest is... Light. You know what he just said? He just said the way you know the darkness is the light. You see, what's the light? It's right there. You know what will happen as you get older? This light, this light right here reveals more and more and more and more. Yes. And over a period of time, there's things you know now that you didn't know a long time ago. Now, if the Bible tells me I'm not supposed to have anything to do with those things, come to 1 John chapter number 2. Uh, let me just say this to you, and I'm going to try to move past it. But it's better that you don't open the gates, the windows, the bars, and the doors. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. Now, I wasn't going to, but I'm going to. Um, I know an uh, individual who uh, every year they had a, 
It's the guy with the mask. I don't, don't tell me what it is and I don't want to know, but there was a guy with a, a mask and it was a, I don't know, some kind of a long series of movies is connected with Halloween. Anyway, he was some kind of, it wasn't the guy with the knives for fingers. It was another fellow there. And he would show up and he slaughtered all kind of people and killed all kind of people and then they thought they killed him and then he came back and he had this mask thing on him, a hockey mask or something. I can't remember it. If I could, I'd tell you. Don't shout it out. But, but at any rate, this mom told me, she said, yeah, every Halloween what we do is we watch the latest uh, edition of that stuff. She said, and my kids just get scared to death and they ball up. It's so cute. The same lady called me up a couple of years later and she said, Preacher, can I ask you a couple of questions? And I said, well, yeah, you can talk to your pastor. She said, well, I talked to my pastor, but I don't really get some help there. And I said, okay, well, what can I do for you? She said, well, she said, I'm having problems. And I said, well, what are the problems? She said, my kids can't sleep. I'm telling you before the Lord. And I said, well, I don't know what your pastor said to you, but it probably has to do with what they're watching before you put them to bed. Oh, well, he said the same thing. I would just expect that. Did he call you? Uh, no, ma'am. But you're the one that told me a couple of years ago that you watched this yep. Halloween show thing every year and you thought it was funny to watch your kids get scared. There it is. And those kids don't forget that. Your kids at an early age, their mat is like a piece of, uh, do you remember what it is when you had back in the days you had carbon paper? Do any of y'all remember that? <laughs> I'm telling my age now, when you type, you put in a piece of paper behind the other paper. That was your copy. They didn't have copy machines. You didn't have email. You had snail mail and mail rooms. Not mail, M-A-L-E, M-A-I-L. You had mail rooms, big businesses. You know where you got your start in big business? When you came to work at a corporation, you started in the mail room. Sorting mail and taking mail like a little postman to all these places and that. And when you type, you put in a piece of carbon paper and you typed it and that way you had a copy of your correspondence. You didn't run over to a machine and then after that came the mimograph. You remember that? You put it in there, that stuff make you high when you smell it. I didn't even know what it was to be high, but it's kind of like, you know, I'll go make the copies, you know. <laughs> I didn't know. It's kind of like, man, I'm doing pretty good. You know, it's kind of like, what are you doing? I've been making copies, Dad. He's like, what is wrong with you, boy? <laughs> but that stuff that, that you pour chemicals in there, man, it's like huffing glue. I didn't know that till later on. It's just spin the thing off there and that kind of a deal. Remember the big drum? Do you remember that at all? And running it through that fluid and that kind of a deal? Some of you are thinking, man, it's wrong to bring those days back again. You know? <laughs> no, we ain't bringing those days back again. But ladies and gentlemen, you know what you got to be careful about? You got to be real, real careful when it comes to those things because your kid's mind is like that. It puts a carbon copy in their head of what they saw. I cannot begin to tell you, and I won't tell you, how many kids, because they were watching certain things occur, they thought they were looking right out that window right there at reality. And I cannot tell you how many perverts used that opportunity to say, well, see, everybody else does that in order to take advantage of them because they thought they were looking through a window because they didn't have the discernment, and it got imprinted on their mind. And until they got up in school and found that everybody didn't do that, they didn't even know what it was going on. Now, I'm talking about the unfruitful works of darkness. He said, don't have anything to do with it. It's not balancing out my opinion, not telling you how to raise your kid, just making a suggestion to you. It's not balancing out that kid's uh, 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 intellect, intellectualism by showing him things of darkness or her things of darkness. Amen. It's a good way to scare the tar out of them. And it's a good way, I believe, to open up demonic things. Amen. All right, now when it comes to loving the brethren, this is one of the things you have to do. And one of the things I wanted to mention to you this morning, and I failed to, come back to 1 John chapter 4, please, is the fact that the Bible commands you to love the Jew. And you have to recognize whether you like him or not, you're commanded to love him. And so you have to recognize there's a difference in liking and loving. And you have to recognize that doesn't mean that you're going to get along with everybody. But you have to learn to love them because of what the Lord told you to do. 
Jewish people can sometimes be difficult to be around. But the Lord said you're to love them. The Jewish people are God's chosen people, not His bride. You're His bride. That's God's chosen people. They're still the apple of His eye. You're not. You're His bride. You get a special place and a special dispensation that was revealed to the Apostle Paul that they didn't even know anything about in the Old Testament. But when it comes to that Jew right now, you know what? Whether you like what's going on or not, you know what you have to learn to do? You have to learn to love them. You say, well, I don't really like them. He didn't ask you to like them. He asked you to love them. You say, what? And love covers a multitude of sins. It's hard though, isn't it? It's easy to love people that love you. But Christ-like love is learning to love people that you don't love. They're unlovable. That's what the Lord did for us. I'm just giving you the Bible. Just If you're going to walk with the Lord, you've got to walk like He walks. I wouldn't love them any more at all than God loves you. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, give, them a, I wouldn't give them an ounce. But loving them doesn't mean you have to condone things they're doing this wrong. But in the Lord, He says, you love them, do you pray for them? Look in 1 John chapter number 4, come down to verse number 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You know how I would say that? If God so loved us, we should love Him. That's not what He said. He said, if God loved you, you ought to love others. That's nauseating. <laughs> That's what He said. Look at the next verse. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. How's that for your Thanksgiving get-together coming up? 1 John chapter number 2. The Bible teaches you in 1 John 4, around verse number 18, He said, Perfect love, uh, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, before fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. That's not fear in God. That's if I love Him, then I don't fear reprisals. I do what I'm supposed to do. God holds you accountable for what you do, not what they do in reciprocation. Let's work through this now. Stay with me. Don't, don't throw me out the window yet. Look in 1 John chapter 2. Some of you are still upset about Halloween. Well, build a bridge and get over it, okay? You're in church. We had an entire family get up when I preached a message on drinking. An entire family got up, and the, I'll give this to the man. He at least came back in there on orders from his wife. But I'll give, you, I'll give this much. She was mad as a wet hen, boy. Looked like you sprayed her with a garden hose, man. I mean, she the whole time she just she just sat back and just just mad. He comes by. I just want you to know, Pastor will not be back. I said, you just told me three weeks ago it's the best church you ever been in. Sure, love this place, it's a great place. And I said, you never. I said, you stood up and testified. And he says, well, you know, we don't see eye to eye on some things. I said, what some things? What don't we see eye to eye on? He said, that stuff you preach tonight, we just don't believe. We teach our family it's fine to have a little wine for your stomach's sake when you're sitting down at the table for dinner. I said, okay, well, that's fine for your family. You going to leave the church over that? He said, well, the way you preach it is you preach like we're committing a sin. I said, I'm telling you what the Bible says. You do with it whatever you want to do with it. And if you hadn't told me that, I'd have never known nothing about it. I said, come on, man. Be honest with me. You ain't leaving the church over drinking now. Come on. He said, nope, that's why we're leaving. He said, because we don't think that's a problem with it. We're going to go to a church. Well, I said, well, what if their church is wrong on the other things? I said, you have any other things doctrinally wrong? We can't find a thing. I said, okay, you believe the Bible's right? Yeah, we believe the Bible's right. And I said, believe the King James Bible? He said, yep. I said, what else do you have? He said, nothing. He said, but that's one line I just can't cross. I said, well, then go ahead and pop the top, ask the Lord to bless it, and quit worrying about it then. And when I preach on it, just say, you don't really care what I say. And go on about your act killing. Why would you leave the church over that? Amen. Well, we're just going to have to leave. Walked out the door. Never seen them again. They probably tune in every now and then just to see if we're still going. They figure that probably all of y'all left with them. <laughs> That's how people are when they do that. They think you agree with them. I don't care if you pop the top or not. That's not my business. I think it's wrong. I think it's a bad testimony. I think I could give you a string of horrific things that have happened as a result of it. I think you're a fool if you do it, and I'll call you a fool if you do it. But if you want to do it, your own business. Amen. 
That's your family. You want to give them a Shirley Temple? Help yourself. Give them a frozen daiquiri without the dac in it? That's your business. I think you're a fool. I think you're an absolute fool if you think I'm going to have one of them little uh, champagne cups with strawberry stuff poured in the top of it and an umbrella in that. I guess it's how you do that. And sit there and say, well, I just like frozen strawberry drinks. I think you're a fool. I, don't, I wouldn't do that. You walk in, you know what you think? Preacher, what you doing drinking? Oh, there's no alcohol in it. Here, you want to taste it? I care too much about you to have that kind of, to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to have you in question. Well, I think our preacher, you know, he's sitting up at the bar. You know, well, there wasn't no other seats. I'll find I'll go get somewhere else to eat. I'm not going to sit at the bar. Amen. Come on now. You, you think, honestly, you think you're going to see me, you know, Here comes one of the kids in the church, you know. <laughs> Rapture happens. <laughs> and the Lord lets you just swallow it and you turn green. <laughs> Lord, I thought we got a glorified body. Yeah, I just thought it'd be funny to watch that. I'm not going to do that. Amen. You say, what is it? It's a manifest manifestation of my love for you. You know, I don't look at other women. You say, because you're not human, you're queer or something. No. It's a manifestation of my love for her. I don't really care what you think about her. She's been with me for 44 years. I don't care if she winds up looking like Noah's Ark. That's not why I married her. You say, what is that? That's a manifestation of your love for the brethren. Yes. I can, but I can't. Right, right. Amen. Amen. Come on. I have to consider the weaker ones. The manifestation is, for me as a preacher, I have to live a life and do my best to live it beyond reproach. Amen. You say, why? Because I love you, that's why. Amen. I don't get to do what I want to do. Yes. I don't care if you wear shorts. I got asked this the other day. Preacher, I ain't never seen you in shorts. Well, first of all, you don't want to see me in shorts. <laughs> That's something you just ain't, you just, it's like, why did he do that? <laughs> I don't care if you wear them. But for me, it's a personal conviction. For me, I'm out of uniform. I was at a place up in Tennessee. I've been going up there for years and years and years now. And uh, the preacher asked us, said, hey, me and my wife would like to take you to the place to go eat. And uh, we went to a place to go eat there. And uh, I had on a, a, a nice shirt, a dress shirt, and a pair of jeans. She said, I've never seen you in regular clothes before. <laughs> she was serious. And I said, well, I thought about wearing something else. And she said, no, no, no. That, I, she said, but I just, she said, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen you not in a suit. Thank you. I wasn't improperly dressed. I'm just saying there's you know, certain things you have to learn to do for the benefit of other people even though you got the liberty to do it. You say, why? Because you love them? Come on now, be honest. Come on, be honest. And there are things that you could do that you don't do because you know your kids are watching. Do you know why? It's not because you're worried about them kids doing it. It's because you love those kids. Ain't there certain things come to your mind sometimes and then you realize the little kiddies are listening? Yes, sir. And you reel it in because you love them? Yes, sir. Amen. Ain't that what Christ did? Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Didn't He come down here and do without so we could have? That's it. So what is that? That's the Christian life. Amen. It's, I love you. That's how you manifest your love. It's, I can, but I uh, can't. Because I love you. What if they take it and run off the deep end with it? Well, that's their problem. 
First John chapter number two. Are you there? Is this making sense to you? You say, why don't you do Halloween, preacher? Because you're afraid of candy? No, because I love you. I'll take the hit. Man, my preacher preaches against it. You know one of the greatest things my daddy ever did for me? I was getting ready to, they were having some big shindig and kind of a thing there. They called it in my day, they called it a sock hop. And that's because you went, don't out yourself. And that's because you went into the gym. And in those days, the gyms were made out of hardwood floors. And they would come in there and spend all kind of money. And then they would polish those floors off after they painted them. And they could scratch real easy. And you could only get out there in your Converse tennis shoes or your socks. You couldn't wear hard-soled shoes or boots or nothing. And they were having this big thing that was going to be after the, the Letterman's uh, dinner thing. Uh, you lettered in a sport. They had a big banquet and stuff. And then after that, they were going to have a thing called a sock hop. And they put a ball up there and spin it around, put a light on it and all that kind of a deal. And you feel like you're in Twilight Zone or something. I don't know. And I'm kind of running back and forth. And my dad says, well, bud, what do you think? And I said, well, dad, you know, everybody's going. And he said, yeah, I'm sure they probably are. And I said, well, you know, the boys I play ball with, they're going. And, and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I, I don't know, Daddy. I don't know. He said, well, you think you belong there? You think you, need to, think you ought to go? And I said, well, Daddy, you know everybody else is going to go. And he said, okay, well, I'm asking you. What do you think? You're a big letterman now. You've got a letterman jacket and all that stuff. You lettered in football. It's a good deal. Good. He said, what do you think? And I said, well, Daddy, I don't know. I mean, I mean what am I? What do you think my friend? He said, well, he said, let me ask you this. How about if you tell your friends that I said no? And I said, can I tell them that? And he said, yeah, if you want to tell them that. I said, okay, deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he should have let you just go, okay, just shut up a minute. My friends are like, hey, are you going? I said, no, ma'am, my daddy said he'd kill me if he caught me in a place like, I mean, I blew it up where they could see it, you know. <laughs> I didn't just say, well, my daddy said no. I said, my daddy said he'd kill me if I showed up at that place. And by the way, I ain't got no socks and ain't got holes in them. So I ain't, you know, I ain't going. <laughs> he said, what did he do? He did me a favor. He took it on him. And you say, why? Because he loved me. He made it easy. I'm getting ready to go after a ball game and a bunch of guys are going to get some pizza and stuff. And there was a couple of older fellows there. And uh, I, I went by after the game. My dad was always sitting up in the stands. And I come by there and I get ready to go to the locker room. I said, Dad, some guys are going to get pizza. He says, you want to go? And I said, well, it's not school night, Friday night. And, you know, we won the game. They're going to have a big, uh, big get together and stuff like that. And uh, I said, uh, well, I said, I, I'm just going to go get pizza. There's not going to be no partying or nothing like that. And he said, well, okay, who are you going with? Where are you going? So on and so forth. Found out a guy that I played ball with, a big old guy. That he trusted him. And he said, okay, I got at that place. And all of a sudden, man, here comes a pitcher of beer. Set right on the That's in my day, man. This is years ago. I'm talking in, in the 60s. And here comes a pitcher of beer. And they set it down like that. And I went, uh-oh. And the guy sitting next to me, his name was uh, Crane, David Crane. He had a, a 57 Studebaker, all hopped up, fixed up and all that. And he said, uh, what's the matter, man? I said, man, if my daddy walks in here any minute, he, he's going to stink and kill me. Get me out of here. And he said, I ain't getting you out of here, man. Just tell him no thank you. I said, no, man. I went out of the payphone and I dropped the dime in. You don't have pagers and stuff like that. My dad had 8861782. That was my number in Tennessee. 8861872. 8861872. Hey bud, uh, daddy you better come get me. Are you all right? Um uh, yeah, well, uh I just need you to come get me. He pulls up down there, driving a Thunderbird. He pulls up down there, and he said, uh, I'm standing out front. Everybody else is inside. I'm the idiot. You know, I'm standing outside, and it's cold, and I'm out there walking around. Man, look like Opie Taylor in Mayberry, you know. I'm out there, you know, walking around, <laughs> stuff like this, and sit down about three seconds and get back up, you know, where's Dad at, you know, and all this, and maybe I should be in there, and they're laughing and poking and stuff like that, and I'm walking around and stuff like that. I get there, man, I jump in the car like, you know, I'll just rob the place or something. I'm like, get out of here, you know, and he says, what is the matter? Uh, I said, Dad, there's a couple of older fellows that came in there and they got some, uh, he said, got some what, son? And I said, uh, 
he got some beer, Daddy, and I, I didn't. And he said, well, what'd you tell him? I said, I told him you'd kill me if you caught me in there. <laughs> and he said, good for you, boy. Amen. He said, let's go to Crystal. Man, a crystal will beat a pizza any day of the week, man. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Thank you. I mean, I didn't get just, he said, how many you want? I said, I want 10. He said, give that boy 10. I said, can I have an extra pickle? He said, put an extra pickle. Put all them things on there, man, and shovel them up there and put them on, put them all there. Stuffed them in them little things like that. 10 and a chocolate milkshake. <laughs> With my daddy. Why would I remember something like that happened to me in the ninth grade? Because he loved me. Put it on me, boy. Tell him I said no. My goodness, man, what a daddy. I don't care if they don't like me. He said, what is that? That's a manifestation of his love for me. He took it for me. I got to saw Christ in that. I didn't even know what I was seeing. Yes. Put it on me. Save it. I can, but the Lord said uh, he'll get me if I do. You think the Lord's like, oh, don't make me out to be the bad guy. My dad could care less. <laughs> I will tell you this. I got to move on. <laughs> I will tell you this. My dad came back in the locker room one day and the guys, I started hearing people talking and they were going, that's him, that's him, that's the guy, that's him, that's him right there, that's him. And I'm like, and I said, oh, it's just my dad. It's like, that's your dad? Oh, he's the one that's going to kill us, you know? <laughs> that's a good thing. He came back, he said, hey, bud, he said, I just thought I'd come back and wish you a good game and I'll be watching you. Didn't think I was going to get back in town in time, but just want you to know it's good to see you. Proud of you, son, he said, in front of everybody. <laughs> you know what, some of you, you'd be embarrassed. You'd be ready to call under the carpet somewhere if your daddy came back in the locker room in front of all your friends and said to you, hey, boy, I love you. I don't know, I'll be watching out for you. My dad was a professional ball player, man. They didn't know all of that stuff. <laughs> Talk about athletes. He was an athlete. But you know what? He didn't come back there and say, yeah, I'm, I'm a professional athlete. I know what it's like in these locker rooms, boy. He came back to say, uh, hey, boy, I want you to know I love you. Amen. Made it back in town. Be watching it tonight. Amen. Amen. I'll be honest with you. I make a couple of plays. You know, maybe the whole game, maybe only made a couple of plays. But when I made a play... And get up off the ground and kind of. <laughs> I'd see him. Out of boy. You ever look up? Lord, I made a play. Were you watching? Are you proud of me? You ever care that he's in the stands watching you? You ever think about that? He makes every game. He doesn't miss a thing you do. You ever just look to see if he's... Did I do good? That old man had come down out of them stands. He was old to me at that time. I didn't know he wasn't that old, but he was old to me at that time, man. I might not have had such a good game. The back end, the time I played, man, the back end of my uniform, the front looked like it had been Clorox. And the back end, man, they pushed me around all day like a plow in a fresh plowed field of turnips, man. Those two big old tackle, I mean, they wore my hind end out all night long. I don't know why the coach didn't just pull me out and say, man, there's no hope, unless they just needed a blocking dummy. They beat the tar out of me, man. And uh, I got done, man, and I'm walking. And I got grass all in the backside of my uniform and down in my socks and stuff like that, man. It's all in the back part of my shoulder pads and all that kind of a deal. And I'm coming out and I'm holding that thing. And we're big fiberglass cleats in those days. And click and click, walking along that way and dragging my helmet, you know, walking that way. And there he's standing right there and I'm thinking... I ain't got much to be proud of. You know what he did? He patted me on the hind end. He said, that a boy. Good game. 
I'm thinking, you must have a different perspective than I did. I got in the car and I said, what do you mean good game? And he said, one of the best games you've ever played, boy. You're getting senile, man. He said, they plowed your taters, didn't they? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, more than once. He said, yeah, but you kept getting up. Amen. He said, I'd take guts, boy. He said, you turned a couple of them inside. I was at the time I had played defensive end. Your job's to turn the play inside. You don't always have to make the play, but you don't let them run over you and get outside of you. He said, hey, you turned them in a couple of times. I said, maybe a couple of times. But you ever think of that? And you mess up. The Lord said, well, good game. Amen. Lord, I got my taters plowed. Yeah, you did, but you didn't quit. You say, what is that? That's the Father's love He's bestowed on you. Yeah. He's not interested in all your successes. He's interested in proving to you He loves you even when you fail. Amen. Have you ever failed? Amen. 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 There's nothing like a mom or a daddy that loves you in spite of having a bad, bad game or a bad grade or you make a mistake. You think you can beat the love of the Father that's been bestowed on you? You know what he said? God loves you. You ought to love each other. Let me give you one more. It's getting uh, that time of the evening time. We need to break it off here. 1 John chapter number 2. Verse number 9. Preacher, why do you tell me things like that? Because I realize now the sacrifice that parents have to make on the behalf of kids. And it moves me. Especially you women. You give up careers and you give up life and you give up where you could be or whatever and you dump everything you've got and your heart included into the kids. Amen. That, that just, I, I know you're not going to like this, but that's Christ-like. You give up your will and your wishes for their benefit. That touches me. I like, I like that. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 9. I'm getting to it. He that saith he is in the light, that's what we're talking about, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Am I reading the Bible? Yes. Pretty plain. But then he goes on to say, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. You know what he just said to you there, ladies and gentlemen? He just said to you that if the Lord loved you, you ought to love each other. And if you don't love each other, you know what he just said to you? I know where it fits doctrinally. Don't be in such a big hurry to jump to the doctrinal application of the thing. Look at the practical application. You know what he said? You're kidding yourself if you have animosity towards your brothers or your sisters in Christ and you say you're walking in the light. Amen. Did I read it to you? Well, preacher, you know, I, I see what it says, but I just really think, okay, I can't help you. You can do with it what you want to do with it. Let's stand together, if you could, please, and be dismissed.